let's have some noise in the room. Good evening, everyone. That's much better. Well, it's my pleasure to be here today and share my thoughts on the future of work. Uh, recently, we published this very interesting ebook, From and To. From means where we are today, To means where exactly we'll go in the future. And one of the ideas, we published 42 ideas in this uh, ebook. And one of the ideas that we published, uh, you know, is from free Wi Fi to Wi Fi free zones in the future. So you go to any cafe, any restaurant, you will get this, you know, board, free Wi-Fi. But in the future, we'll witness Wi-Fi free zones because we really need to encourage the human interaction. We really need to cultivate it. So just like Dr. Kanan, I'm not an architect, neither I'm a planner nor a consultant, but I'm a futurist. And I'm here to tell you a story, a story about the future of work and the workspaces. Because when we talk about, when we think about the future workspaces, we have to really understand the future of work. How the work is going to get evolved and shaped in the future. And what it means from the workspace standpoint. How exactly humans and machines will work together. And what is the role of humans that is going to be in the future. And that's exactly what we'll try to explore as part of today's session. So let's get started. So this is an era of great head scratching if you look at it. Being a leader is quite a tough job today. In the past, it was so easy to do business. You knew it very well. You had to do two things. One, grow company's revenue. B, reduce cost. And how would you grow revenue? With better products, better sales, better marketing. And how would you decrease cost? With supply chain optimization, rationalization. But now, something very interesting that is happening now. The pace of change that is happening very, very fast and it's becoming increasingly difficult for leaders, for government leaders, for business leaders to figure out what is going to make sense in the market, in the society. And thanks to the fourth industrial revolution, what the World Economic Forum had hailed as the fourth industrial revolution in 2016 is now upon us. A time of economic dislocation when old ways of working gave way to new ones. In a similar fashion, the first industrial revolution was driven by the invention of loom. Second was steam engines. Third was the assembly lines. That's where China succeeded. And now the fourth industrial revolution will be driven by machines. Machines that seem to think. But as you can see, we are in the very early innings of the fourth industrial revolution. We are at the bottom of what we call the s curve. What does it mean? It means that all the innovation, disruption, investments, what we have seen so far, it's nothing. Over the next few years, as we are going to move upward the S-curve, there is going to be a rapid explosion in investments that is coming from governments, from businesses and building the digital economy. There is going to be much more disruption, the greater pace of innovation that we will witness as we move forward. And that's where 70% of executives are saying that the industry will change more in the next five years than it did in the previous five. So you can very well imagine the pace of change that is coming along our way. So speed is the new currency of business. Market changes that used to happen in decades, in years, are now happening in months and in weeks. So if you're not moving fast enough, someone else will. So it is speed that determines whether you disrupt or you are getting disrupted. And at the heart of it, you know, just think about it. At the heart of the speed, at the heart of the fourth industrial revolution is artificial intelligence. So decades in the making, finally, AI is out of the laboratory and infusing itself into each and every aspect of our lives. Over the next few years, AI will be all around us. It'll help us educate our children, heal our sick, you know, lower our energy bills, and uncover many new aspects of our society. But just think about it. We consume AI on a daily basis, and we don't even realize it. When we are connected with friends on Facebook, you know, buying something online, hailing a cab with Uber, these are AI platforms that are already in action. We can them. They have become sort of a daily helper to make our lives, you know, a little more enjoyable. But now what's happening is the commercial aspect of AI is becoming very, very interesting. Eight out of ten hedge funds in the US, they made eight billion dollars purely based on AI algorithms. A human radiologist can read 20,000 films a year with 82% accuracy, and a machine can do it 30 times faster with almost 100% accuracy. The amount of reading you will do in two weeks, a machine can do it in two hours. And we have already seen the driverless cars have already driven millions of miles. So the commercial aspect of AI is becoming very, very interesting. And that's where we're witnessing 
that the age of AI has truly arrived within Asia. 82% of executives who recently spoke to this said that AI will have a significant impact on their work in the next five years. So the message received is loud and clear. Either you embrace the age of AI or be prepared to be left behind. And it's happening across industries, whether you are in retail or in financial services uh, you know, organization, AI is going to change the way we do our business. AI will fundamentally change our business and operating models in the next uh, you know, five years. Or so. But the age of AI is also generating mixed emotions if you think about it. On one hand, you have a capitalist dream there's tremendous pressure on business leaders to reduce costs, to grow revenue. There is no way they can ignore the enormous benefits of these new technologies. So they will go after you know, embracing these technologies. But on the other hand, AI means maybe layoffs. So we are asking ourselves whether it is a capitalist stream or a labor nightmare. So just to give you an example, you know, the pace of change that is happening around us is a result of AI. So this is Go board game. Does anyone know about Go game? Have you heard of or played? Okay. So look at the complexity of this game. So just to compare it with chess, chess has possible 400 next possible moves. But when it comes to the Go board, 130,000 next possible moves. And the number of possible positions on a Go board exceeds the number of atoms in the universe. I have no clue how many atoms are there in the universe. Neither I can add, you know, number of zeros to it. But the point is, it is quite a complex game. And meet Lee Sedol, who's the Go, you know, World Go champion. And in 2016, the AlphaGo, the AI software, defeated Lee Sedol in the Go board game. And this game has been around for ancient times. You know, it is considered for more than 2,000 years, the game has been around. And all it took in AI software just two years to beat the World Go champion. This is scary. And this is what Lee had to say. I apologize for being unable to satisfy a lot of people's expectations. I kind of felt powerless. That is the word here, powerless. I was incapable of overcoming it. This is scary. And now in November 2019 only, Lee Sedol had announced retirement. He's only 36 years old. And at the age of 36, he retired from this tournament, from playing, you know, go game at all. Why? Because he felt that it is not possible to defeat the machine at the end of the day. So definitely, all this making us very, very scary about the future of work. Especially on top of it, when you have renowned institutions like Oxford claiming that 47% of jobs will disappear over the next 20, 25 years. So all this making us rethink the fundamentals of our institutions and the very nature of work itself. So this is an interesting site, will robot take my job? So just you go to the site, type, type your job title, it'll tell you what is the probability of your job getting automated in the future. So I looked at this title of architects. Any guesses, what is the probability of architect as a job getting automated over the next 5, 10, 15 years? Any guesses? 100%? Okay. Who else? 20, 30, 40, what do you think? 130%, okay. 95%, okay. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Only 1.8% is the probability of architect as a job getting automated. And there's a reason for that. And you know what's the reason? The reason is when it comes to the future of jobs, there are three scenarios what we really need to look at. The job automation, the job enhancement, and new jobs creation. Unfortunately, 90% of today's conversation is happening in the job automation bucket. That's why you keep seeing media headlines that robots are coming and they're going to take our job. That's why there are so many predictions that prevail in the market today about the loss of jobs to machines. But we believe 90% of tomorrow's conversation is going to be in these two buckets job enhancement, and new jobs creation. And as per our estimates, only 12% of jobs are at the risk of being taken over by bots. Only 12%. But still, we are talking about millions of jobs globally. So yes, there will be job losses. But what's more important is, 75% of existing jobs 
are going to get enhanced with new tools and capabilities, which means that your job remains, but the job description, the performance metrics, the outcome levels are going to get altered with new tools and capabilities. And then 13% of net new jobs will also be created in the future that no one usually talks about. So the point is, we tend to confuse, the issue is we tend to confuse between a job and a task. So if you're an architect, that's your job. So what do you do as an architect? You perform a number of tasks, from design to creativity, you know, to, to uh, interacting with clients, and a number of other tasks that you perform. And now, with the new machine, some or many of these tasks will be taken care of. And that's going to happen for good. Because now you as an architect can focus more on what really matters to your clients, what really matters to the futuristic ideas. So you can be more focused on innovation, you can be more focused on work that really matters. So during the networking hours, you know, if you're going to interact with folks around, ask them, what task do you do instead of what do you do? That's more important. We have to look at the task of a job that are going to get automated in the future. And talking about new jobs, if 10, 15 years ago I had told you that there is going to be a job of Twitter, data wrangler in the future, you would have laughed at me. But we have witnessed over the last 10 to 15 years with the rise of social media, digital platforms, new jobs emerged. Jobs that we never thought of. So why the future is going to be any different? So that's why in 2017, we did this report, 21 Jobs of the Future, a guide to getting and staying employed over the next 10 years. So based on various trends, demographic, economic, social, technological, political trends. So we looked at various trends and came up with these 21 jobs that do not exist today. But we believe that these are the jobs that will become cornerstone of the future of work. And we have placed these jobs on a scale of uh, you know, time horizon of 10 years and then on, based on the tech centricity. And as you can see, some jobs are highly technical in nature and some jobs are not technical at all. One of my favorites is Walker Talker. Walker Talker in a world of Digital, now first, we need humans. We need someone that you can walk with, that you can talk to, right? So walker talker, just like you know, you you book your uh, you know your your uh, car on Uber. In a similar way, there's going to be a platform through which you are going to book someone else's time. Someone who's going to come to your place can walk you with, and definitely can talk to you whatever you want to talk. About. So that is going to be the walker talker role that we have created. So based on the huge success of 21 jobs, so what we did, 21 more jobs of the future. So everything remains same in terms of tech centricity, in terms of time horizon, but now we have 21 new more you know, ideas. So now in total we have got 42 ideas. And they are not science fiction. Some of these jobs we have already witnessed emerging in organization. For instance, man machine uh, you know, team manager. So if the future of work and workforce is going to be hybrid, we need someone who can manage machines as well. So man-machine teaming manager is going to be the new role that has emerged in Cobalt Robotics, a robotic arm as a robot you know, manager. So definitely these two reports are available in the public domain in case you want to have a look at it. Definitely will give you some food for thought, the kind of jobs that will potentially emerge in your client's organization as we move forward. So how to be the scary bots? What exactly we really need to do? So machines, there is no doubt that machines are going to become smarter and machines are going to pick up a number of discrete tasks as time goes on. But humans still need to apply. How exactly we are going to beat the scary bots? Any thoughts? Or can we beat the machine at the end of the day? <laughs> That's an interesting one. Any other thought? How to beat the scary bot? How exactly we are going to meet machines in the future? Absolutely. So we don't need to beat the machines in the future. We have to work alongside machines as we move forward. So we asked organizations about various skills that are going to be important in the future. And as you can see, robotics and AI came at the top, which is not a surprise. But what's more interesting is soft skills. Communication, problem solving, leadership. 80% of organizations are saying that these skills are going to be very, very much important in the future. So just think about it. It may sound counterintuitive, but in a world of pervasive technology, things that you and I and all of us do naturally, but computers struggle with, will become even much more important in the future. Bots, they can't dance, they can't raise the chart, they can't provide a comfort to the patient, they can certainly help 
but they can't do it. And that shall remain the case at least for the next several years. So the future of work won't be about beating the bots, but rather how to become a better human. How exactly we can double down on human-centric skills. Even some of the most, you know, important jobs like data science or big data, you know. So even these jobs require soft skills because as a big data, data scientist, you should be able to tell a story. What are the findings that you have got from the data? So can you be a good communicator? And then, can you write it well to tell the story in the form of report or presentation, whatever you are presenting? Okay? So be a good human being. That is the crux. So the simple math is whether you are in a B2B or in a B2C job, it's all about becoming a better human. Because the future of work and jobs will reflect the very basic fact that technology has not robbed us. We do not want technology just for the sake of it. We want technology as a tool to enable us, to help us. And that's exactly future jobs will reflect. That technology has helped us and not robbed us what we value the most, the humanity piece. So that's where new types of organizations are needed. Organizations that can help us feel, become more human. And that's where new places are going to be in very much demand. What sort of places are we talking about? But for that, we have to really understand how the future organization is going to look like. If you look at the traditional organization, it is very much hierarchy oriented. We all have this goal to become a vice president of the organization and then we are done with our career. We'll be happy to retire after that. But in the world of modern organization, it is all about hierarchy. So from hierarchy to hierarchy, hierarchy means a collection of network systems through which you can get the work done regardless of your location, job title, and regardless of the you know, role that you perform at the end of the day. So from hierarchy to hierarchy. And then some of the traits of traditional organization is all about functional. Traditional organization work in silos. You have various departments, every department is busy managing their mandate. And they are homogeneous, intuition-based, centralized. So the power, the decision-making is very much centralized. Only few, handful of people are taking decisions at the end of the day. But now, in our world of modern organization, right, we all will be responsible to take decisions. We all will be free to take decisions for the work that really matters to us. It's going to be more social, more mobile, more nimble, adaptive, collaborative, dynamic community. So that's how the structure of a modern organization is going to look like. And that's where organizations, if they don't embrace the structure of a modern organization, obviously they are going to be left. Because talent will move to organizations where they find all these characteristics that are going to help them stay within the organization. And that's exactly the reason why workspace really needs to shift towards the trend that is happening in the market today. So we found that organizations are saying back office work will definitely go away. There is going to be a significant reduction in the back office work. Rather, there is going to be more focus on front end, the customer service, how to create new customer value, how to enhance the customer satisfaction levels. So these are the roles, these are the tasks, the work areas that are going to be very much important in the future. And our workspaces should reflect the change, the shift that is happening around us. Work is recalibrating from the back office to the front. This is something which is happening right now. And if you think that the future of work is going to be all virtual, you don't need to come to the office, it is going to be WFH or work from anywhere, anytime. I'm sorry to disappoint. Leaders are clearly rejecting this idea of no office culture. In fact, they say that 13% increase in both workforce and workplace size in the next five years. So if you think that there are going to be you know, empty real estate you know, buildings or offices over the next few years, I'm sorry, they won't be. So definitely yes, what leaders are talking about, what they're thinking is, how can we create a space that is more inclusive, that is providing this sort of conducive environment for people to collaborate with each other, to talk to each other, and ultimately get the work done. So definitely yes, the future workspace will require you know, the physical spaces as we move forward, right? And there is a theory of the virtual workforce and the workplace, right? Obviously, it's going to be a reality, but it's not the only thing. But rather, WFH or work from anytime, anywhere is going to be the extension of your physical, you know, workspace as we move forward. 
and modern businesses that's where look and feel very very different you know if you just think about it. some examples are like apple google facebook how these companies have invested millions of dollars in building the infrastructure and in building the space that encourage you know innovation that encourage creativity because that's how these organizations have created have become big disruptors in their respective domains and if you look at you know apples california you know uh, they their headquarter and uh, definitely it's beautiful they have got the underground theater as well and the whole objective of putting a theater is uh, to encourage people to talk to each other so these companies right are smartly building spaces maybe around the coffee machine or around the kitchen area or in the conference room for people to come together and talk and discuss and test out new ideas google right one of the best tech companies in the world people love to they die to work for google not only for the brand name but also for the google flex the kind of environment that the organization offers and facebook now investing heavily in building the infrastructure that looks like a forest that is close to the nature so the whole idea just think about it just the whole idea of putting up you know infrastructure like this is to encourage people to be more human. How exactly we are going to make humans more human? That is not an easy thing. How we are going to make humans more human? But but providing the infrastructure, the culture, the space that is going to encourage, that is going to encourage people to double down on their human centric skills. And it's already happening, but not every company is like Apple or Google. Not every company has a similar budget that they can invest millions of dollars. and that's where what we really need to do is we really need to understand the future of work between humans and machines because when it comes to the future of work the balance is very very clear we believe humans are what we call the art of the they are quite good at the art of the job the visual cues emotion empathy what's the right thing to do based on the context of the situation we are quite good at it and machines are good at the science of the job you can't beat a computer on number crunch So the computational capabilities, data analysis, based on all statistical evidence, was the most appropriate next action. And when you blend the two, the magic happens. So whether you are a teacher, you are an architect, you are a policeman, you are a politician, we believe each and every role is going to get enhanced with new tools and capabilities. And that's why we need to start rethinking work as red and blue work for tomorrow. So blue work is all about work. where people are better than machines and red work is the work where machines can do much better work than humans so we need to start differentiating the work between these two categories the work and the space in which the work occurs have to be divided by these two categories what exactly is going to come under blue work it's all about the human centric skills that we saw earlier the work demands visual cues emotion empathy so just look at various jobs various tasks that happen across the organization especially the customer service representatives can we help them become more empathetic with the you know customers at the end of the day and then spaces where people gather to iterate experiment discuss and create this is very very important we really need to start uh, you know thinking very very fast we have to fail fast we have to learn fast and we have to iterate fast why because at the end of the day if we really want to meet the demands of the digital economy organizations have to move very very fast but the problem is in many organization you know we do not have this culture of accepting failures right it's usually seen as a taboo but that is a whole fact if we really want to test out new ideas we have to create the culture and that's why leaders need to play a very very proactive role in creating that culture making people comfortable testing out new ideas even if you fail that's fine you're not out of the job so providing that kind of a comfort level to employees is very important there is no dearth of innovation there is no dearth of ideas at all but i think the culture is something that really holds uh, you know individuals back in coming up with new ideas and then red work using technology sensors embedded software to turn spaces red environmental apps what should be the idle temperature in the room and uh, you know the light should be automatically you know go on and off right as and when required everything should be managed by the machine and then productivity apps the focus on teamwork and uh, you know the synchronization instrumented intelligence everywhere if you have alexa siri at home why not alexa siri in the office why can't we have personal assistants you know in the office and these personal assistants can take up number of our discrete repetitive boring work and we as humans can be more focused on what really matters to us which means the blue work so by freeing up our people on the red work side 
we can actually enhance you know, people's skill set in many ways. So what needs to happen in the blue space? These are some of the ideas like you know, break down silos. Obviously, every organization, large organization, usually work in silos. And that's where blue spaces are going to help us break down those silos. The whole idea is to inject the startup thinking, the startup mentality you know, into the culture. And that's where blue spaces are going to play a very important role. And craft new narrative. In fact, we suggest dedicated blue zone can be run as entities in their own. It is not just a department, it is not just a small initiative, but rather a proper entity that organizations can run. And spaces should reflect the blue work that is happening in organizations. And bring the machine into the red space, right? Ultimately, if you look at one of the most frustrating uh, tasks for any employee is to find uh, an empty meeting room in the office. So you have to book it, you have to first of all find it and then book it. It takes a hell lot of time. It can be a little frustrating, you know, especially if you're a very busy organization. So that should be done automatically. That should be taken care of by machine. So you have uh, now, you know, software like uh, cloud booking that can help you manage this stuff. So all I'm saying is we really need to free up our employees, our people from the boring, frustrating, you know, repetitive work so that they can be more focused on the blue work side. And then instrument intelligence, you know, as I said earlier, Alexa, Siri, we should have our personal assistant. This is what we believe that's going to happen on the red work side, where your personal assistants, each and every employee will have his or her personal assistant. That personal assistant will manage more of, most of your schedule, from filling up the timesheet to adjusting the you know, temperature in the room. And you can think of any repetitive or any boring task, machine will take care of. And how exactly we are going to pick our process target for red spaces, you know, for red work. How exactly we are going to do it. So these are the four principles we suggest organizations can follow, which means highly repetitive tasks. Tasks that people do across the organization right, that do not provide any, any fun. It could be order entry, invoice reconciliation, tasks that people do at scale across the organization. So these tasks should be taken care of by machines. And tasks with low demand for human change. If there is any process, any Task, follow a flow chart, if this, do this, if that, do that, should be taken care of by machine. And then task requiring low levels of empathy. The order entry doesn't require any empathy. It requires accuracy, the high level of accuracy. So definitely, if there is any process, any task that require low level of empathy, machines are good at it. And task generating huge volumes of data. Whether it is from coming from sensors, we do not want humans to do any data collection or analysis at the end of the day. It should be taken care of by machines. So these are the four principles that you can follow in identifying the red spaces in the organization. So just to summarize, you know, at the center for the future, of work, we are of strong belief that humans will continue to be at the center of the future of work. And that exactly why we really need to create spaces that should reflect both humans and machines. How exactly the two will collaborate and how organizations can adapt to the age of AI. Because in the absence of which, I'm afraid, we'll continue to build spaces only for humans, only for machines. But what we really need is the amalgam of two, the blend of two. And our spaces should reflect that, which means how red spaces are going to complement the blue spaces at the end of the day. And definitely, as we move forward, right, in the future, we believe work will change, but it won't go up. A world without work is nothing but a fantasy that is no way going to be reality over the next 10 years. So I'm not much worried about what's going to happen in 2050, whether robot army is coming and then going to kill all of us. I'm not much worried about it. I'm more worried about 2013, uh, what's going to happen over the next uh, you know, 10 years. Or so. And if we can manage the next 10 years well, I'm sure we should be fine in the next uh, you know, 20 or 30 years. Because the ultimate success, future is already here, the ultimate success requires an open mind, perseverance, and courage. So that's my story. Thank you very much.